Tonight, from U.S. bases in Iraq and Afghanistan, where there's smoke, there may be a major health crisis for American soldiers. We understand there's bullets, there's bombs, there's those type of issues that we cannot mitigate. But the hazards that we can mitigate, why aren't we doing that for our young men and women in uniform? Also, Louisiana's two main industries collide. What the oil spill means for fishing in the Gulf. Everybody you know is a fisherman. Everybody that walks in that door, generations of fishermen. It would be like a big factory shutting down in a little tiny city. It's the same exact effect. And oil and ice. A native people hope the environmental tragedy unfolding in the Gulf will mean oil rigs won't be coming to their shores. The ocean is our garden. It's our livelihood, our spirit. That's who we are. If anything happens to it, you know, that's like 80% of our traditional food. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Report. Good evening from New York. Tonight, a mystery that doctors and scientists are just beginning to unravel. It began when servicemen and women returning from Iraq and Afghanistan began complaining of breathing problems. And it has grown into what may be the next Gulf War syndrome, the next 9-11 ground zero disease, maybe even the next Agent Orange. All of those maladies were initially dismissed as figments of the imagination. We now know they were all too real, each caused by exposure to environmental hazards. In this case, the military initially said that the suffering soldiers were only victims of coincidence. But that didn't satisfy a small group of doctors and soldiers. They're convinced it can all be traced to something in the air. They can be seen curling into the sky or hanging low to the ground over many U.S. military bases in Iraq and Afghanistan, billowing clouds of smoke emanating from mountains of burning trash. They're called burn pits, and at one point, there were estimated to be hundreds of them in both countries, some small, some enormous. Staggering amounts of waste are generated in military operations. Not only do commanders have to figure out how to fight, they have to figure out what to do with their garbage. For example, here in Baghdad, where thousands of soldiers live and work, hundreds of tons of trash are produced each day. That trash includes many thousands of things like plastic water bottles and foam trays, along with a lot of other stuff. For years, much of it ended up in burn pits. We tried to film the burn pits on a recent trip to Iraq, but the military wouldn't allow it. Many service members have snapped their own photos and videos that they shared with us. This video was given to us by a soldier on the condition that we conceal his identity because he fears losing his military benefits and his job. Iraq, June 12, 2006, and uh, a particularly bad burn day. By far, the largest burn pit was here at Balad Air Base. Balad is a transit zone for soldiers and materials entering the Iraq theater, and its burn pit was the size of several football fields. This is a lovely burn pit. It burned plastic, metal, batteries, anything you can think of that gets discarded, they burn it and we breathe it. Was the burn pit the first thing you noticed? Yes, sir. And what did you say to yourself? Uh, I said, I uh, have a lot of work to do. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Darren Curtis was a bioenvironmental engineer with the United States Air Force. He was sent to Balad Air Base in 2006. His job was to protect the health of his fellow airmen. In this, his first television interview, he told us he was shocked by what he saw. What were they burning in the pits? Every piece of trash that was generated on Balad. Uh, rubber tires? Yes, sir. Plastic? Yes, sir. I've got a list here. Styrofoam? Yes, sir. Paint? Yes, sir. Chemicals? Yes, sir. 
Well, what else were they burning that you'd be concerned about? Uh, electronics uh, uh, that may be, uh, have metals uh, tied to those and, and those sorts of things. Many of those are hazardous materials, right? Yes, sir. Does or does not the Army have regulations concerning the disposal of hazardous materials? Yes, sir, but there are certain regulations that are waived in a combat environment. War zones are tough places. Military regulations recognize that for commanders in battle, disposing of trash is not the first priority, nor should it be. Yet we are burning shit. But when possible, the military is required to avoid the open burning of solid waste and to use incinerators. Incinerators burn at higher temperatures and produce far less toxic smoke. Items considered to be hazardous, for example batteries, lubricants, and oil, are supposed to get special treatment. Still, for years in Iraq and Afghanistan, the military has reportedly been openly burning everything from poisonous paints to live ammunition, often adding jet fuel as an accelerant. As it has for so many support services during both wars, the military relied on contractor KBR to manage the waste at many bases. It's not clear who was actually handling the burn pit at Balad, but for six years, the fire there smoldered day and night, spreading its soot along with its stench into nearby living quarters. It drifts around. I wake up tasting molten plastic in my mouth. Now, the soldiers, were they living downwind, upwind, sidewind from this? Uh, downwind. Which would be the worst place for them? Yes, sir. And were any of the soldiers complaining about the smoke and the toxic plume? I had constant emails, uh, and if anybody knew what my job was, the, the first conversation was always, what are you doing about the burn pit? After dark, when the temperature dropped, the smoke would hang close to the ground. At night was probably some of the worst times, and it's hard to get pictures of, of the smoke plume at night. And that was where a lot of the complaints come from commanders and such that, uh, you know, I came in to work this morning, uh, you know, a, a troop of mine vomited last night from the smoke. Would it have helped, at the very least, to have moved the burn pit so the wind didn't carry the plume and the residue of the burn pit over the area where our troops were living? Uh, that would have been optimal. Curtis wrote a memorandum about the pit in Balad and sent it up his chain of command. In it, he said that it's amazing that the burn pit has been able to operate without restrictions over the past few years. And he called the pit an acute health hazard and warned of the possibility of chronic health hazards associated with the smoke. He listed as possible contaminants arsenic, hydrogen cyanide, benzene, sulfur dioxide, and formaldehyde, just to name a few. As Curtis's memo was circulating in 2006, doctors stateside were puzzling over a stream of service members who had been coming into their offices for two years complaining of breathing problems. Dr. Anthony Sima is a respiratory specialist at the Veterans Affairs Hospital in Northport, Long Island. Most of my patients were 80-year-old white men. And all of a sudden, around 2004, we noticed that there were young women and young men coming into our clinic. These were soldiers who were athletes, and all of a sudden they're coming in for asthma-like symptoms, for lung injury type of symptoms. Dr. Seema, who had studied the respiratory effects of the pollution at 9-11's Ground Zero, recognized similar toxic exposure in the symptoms of the returning soldiers. He decided to run a study comparing the medical records of returning soldiers with those who remained stateside. He found that those who'd been deployed had nearly double the rate of respiratory problems. Did you have any idea what was causing these respiratory problems? I actually did not know. What we speculated initially was it must have been the sandstorm. So, so that's this what, is what you thought at first. That, so that's what we do. I didn't know what a burn pit was. Nobody had told me what a burn pit was. That, that was our original premise. Yeah. At the same time Seema was doing his research, pulmonologist Robert Miller at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee was also seeing a number of service members who could no longer pass their physical fitness tests. 
almost every one of these guys that I saw initially should have been considered an elite athlete. They could run two miles in 13 minutes, and when they came home, they couldn't run two miles. They are shorter breath with running. They're shorter breath walking up inclines. They're shorter breath walking up a flight of stairs. Uh, some of them who had a applied for jobs such as police officers were denied employment because uh, they couldn't pass physical testing standards. A half a mile, a quarter mile, and I'd be incredibly winded like I had just run a marathon, so. One of those elite athletes was 29-year-old Captain Jennifer Blair. Blair, a West Point graduate, was a platoon leader at Ballad from January 2005 yeah. to January 2006. During her second deployment to Iraq, she started having breathing problems, problems that became debilitating by the time she got home. I'm walking up the stairs, I'm walking to meetings, and I'm out of breath. And I'm not talking like out of breath, I'm talking like catch your breath, like I can't walk and talk at the same time. I go to the doctor and I was like, I can't breathe, I don't know what's going on, I feel like I'm having a heart attack or something's going on. And um, he, you know, felt it necessary to do some chest x-rays and they didn't see anything that would indicate, you know, why a 20 some odd year old person was having chest pains or having breathing problems. You went through West Point. Yes. You don't get through there without intense physical training. No. You were a runner? Yes. Had you had any breathing problems before? Absolutely not. I, I don't smoke. Um, I'd run, you know, six miles a day. Blair eventually found her way to Dr. Miller. At the time, Miller was evaluating dozens of soldiers with similar symptoms and the same clean x-rays. Miller decided the only way to diagnose them was to surgically remove a piece of lung and run a biopsy. He says he was startled by what he found. It's a very significant lung injury. You don't see this in normal people. These are the kind of changes you see in patients that have uh, either toxic exposure or they have complications from organ transplantations. Most of the 45 patients he biopsied had damage deep in the lungs, inside their small airways. It's called constrictive bronchiolitis. Miller knew one group of soldiers he looked at had been exposed to a known respiratory toxin from a raging sulfur fire in northern Iraq. The second group of soldiers had been exposed to burn pits. The damage was identical. That told Miller that the burn pits were the likely cause of that second group's lung damage. I don't think that there's any doubt that if a soldier lived next to a burn pit or lived next to burning human waste for months on end, and then they come home with lung injury, that the two are not related. That's what's so frustrating about it is, is that, you know, doing normal daily tasks, you know, going up and down the stairs and doing laundry, it's a challenge now. Before, I would have um, jogged up them with a little bit more pace, but like now, you know, I'm uh, out of breath and it feels like I just ran or, did extreme amount of physical exertion. For this West Point graduate, it's more than a loss of her active lifestyle that concerns Blair. The lung damage leaves her vulnerable to infections. For her, an ordinary cold now could become life-threatening. The biggest fear is, is that something very small can turn into a trip to the hospital and hospitalize for pneumonia. And unfortunately, people die of pneumonia. You got a cold a few weeks ago. I did get a cold a few weeks ago. What happened? I, I was absolutely scared. If I get a cold, I could get bronchitis. If I get bronchitis, I could get pneumonia. If I get pneumonia, then all bets are off. So I went to the emergency room. Were you having chest pains? I have chest pains, and I do get chest pains on a regular basis. Dr. Miller believes Blair's chest pains are a result of her, quote, trying to breathe through a straw. <laughs> He told us he can't predict how her disease will progress as she gets older. I think this is a permanent lung condition. I don't think they're going to get better. I hope that they're not going to get much worse. But I don't think that this is a condition that you can exercise through or condition yourself uh, against. 
I think that these people are going to be permanently limited. The wind shifting is blowing right into us. I want to show that we're breathing toxic fumes. In case there's ever breathing problems or lung issues or anything like that. Dr. Miller says it's too early to know how many troops will come home with lung damage. My concern is that there are thousands of people out there with this condition that are not being recognized. And Dr. Miller told us he believes that the burn pits can also cause fatal lung damage. That's what he believes killed 41-year-old Staff Sergeant Al Greenwood. Dr. Miller diagnosed Greenwood with a rare disease called hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is often related to inhalational exposure. He became symptomatic after being exposed to burn pits in Afghanistan. It did not respond to very aggressive treatment, uh, and he died before he was able to undergo lung transplant. Cleta is Sergeant Greenwood's widow. Dr. Miller, I think, was a little perplexed as to how a young man, as my husband, could get that disease. The only thing that really was in Al's past was his deployment, breathing in all the toxins over there, all the dusts, all the wind blowing all the time. The disease slowly robbed him of the ability to breathe. He'd have these incredible coughing fits that were just, they were just scary. And you could see his face, you could see that he was just grasping, you know, just grasping for air. I sent over a healthy guy. I sent over a really strong man. He was physically strong. He was mentally strong. He used to joke. He used to say, I'm, I'm tough. I'm wood grain. <laughs> Greenwood died two years after being deployed to Afghanistan. Both Dr. Miller and Dr. Seema are submitting their respective research to medical journals. They both told us that their work is just beginning. Scientists will need more in-depth studies to prove definitively that the burn pits are the cause of the respiratory illnesses. Recently, National Jewish Hospital in Denver, one of the nation's leading pulmonary research institutions, gathered doctors Miller and Seema and other scientists from across the country for an academic conference on lung health. The scientists met to discuss the effects of burn pits, sandstorms, and other environmental hazards on service members in Iraq and Afghanistan. National Jewish is now developing a plan for further study on these wartime exposures. But Dr. Seema says there are some things we already know. We do know from the literature that burning these particular chemicals is harmful to your health. For example, if you burn 25,000 styrofoam trays with breakfast every day and inhale it, we know that those chemicals are not safe for human inhalation. We know that. We, we know that there are certain chemicals that you should not burn. The idea of using jet fuel, JP8, to pour on trash and to light it on fire is very dangerous because jet fuel contains benzene, which is a carcinogen. It can cause cancer, so you don't want to be inhaling it. You certainly don't want to be burning it and inhaling it. Uh, JP8 also contains N-hexane, which is a neurotoxin, which may cause neurological disease. Even if you were burning wood fire and it was just a marshmallow roast every day, the amount of smoke generates small particles called particulates, and high concentrations of particulate matter is associated with death, with cardiovascular mortality and respiratory mortality. And that's why Darren Curtis was so concerned when he wrote that memo in 2006. You're an environmental authority, but medical authorities, did they express any concern about this? Doctors, nurses who were there? Yes, the chief of aerospace medicine, uh, whom I worked for, was very concerned about this also, and actually co-signed my memo that I wrote in December of 2006. Curtis and the chief of aeromedical services, Lieutenant Colonel James Elliott, weren't the first ones to raise alarm about the burn pits. Documents show that in the summer of 2006, an Army flight surgeon wrote of potentially worse health effects from the burn pits and a PowerPoint presentation by Major Eric Andrews of the Army Corps of Engineers warned potential health risk from the burn pit are high, and that health effects from elevated concentrations of particulate matter include increased respiratory disease, lung damage, cancer, etc. And as it turns out, all along, there was a solution to the problem sitting right there on the base. 
incinerators were on site. Uh, however, they were not operational. There were incinerators on site. Yes, there sir. Were incinerators there. Yes, sir. But they didn't get hooked up. Yes, sir. Why do you think that was? It was had to do with, with funding and contractual issues. What did you hope to accomplish by that memo? Well, my first thought was we will get the incinerators uh, up and running. Let's, let's, let's protect the people that are going to be there from now in the future. Curtis says he never heard back about his memo. And despite all these warnings, the burn pit at Balad remained in use for three more years. And since then, hundreds of soldiers and civilians with a variety of cancers and other diseases have come forward claiming that burn pit exposure made them ill. Technical Sergeant Anthony Rose was in Balad in 2004. Rolls, a father of three, was diagnosed at the age of 28 with a rare and life-threatening disease called polycythemia vera, or PV. The PV is responsible for his recent heart attack. A daily dose of chemotherapy is now keeping the illness under control. Rolls told us when he was in Iraq, he worried about suicide bombers and improvised explosive devices, not the burning trash, although he says he was well aware of the burn pits. When it got to that they were burning the plastic bottles and the tires and all the other stuff, it would be black, thick, rancid, disgusting smelling smoke. Rolls and other soldiers we talked to told us it wasn't unusual to see body parts. You saw all kinds of things in there. You saw um, animal carcasses. You saw human limbs from amputations. There have been no studies on the link between Rolls PV or any other cancer and the burn pits. It will take years, maybe even decades, of study to see if there's a connection. Researchers will need to prove the rates of cancer for those who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan are greater than the rates of cancer in the general population. But now Rolls and hundreds of other sick service members, their families and civilian employees are suing KBR for their role in managing the burn pits. The plaintiffs claim KBR is responsible for exposing them to toxic smoke, ash, and fumes, which caused injuries such as chronic illnesses and death. Statements filed in the suit indicate that incinerators sat idle at a number of bases while hazardous waste burned openly. Last October, after the Military Times did a series of reports on the burn pits and more sick service members came forward, Congress began to ask questions. And that same month, almost three years after Curtis wrote his memo, the burn pit at Balad was finally closed. We wanted to ask the Department of Defense why they let an incinerator sit idle at Balad and why it took so long to close the burn pit. But they declined our request for an interview. On the Army Health Information website is a report called, quote, Just the Facts. In it, the Army denies that the smoke from the burn pit at Bilad was toxic. They say they studied the emissions from the burn pit and found the level of dangerous chemicals, quote, were within acceptable standards and that the environmental health risk from the smoke was low. But Darren Curtis questions the validity of the Army's findings. He ought to know he helped design the study and conducted some of the sampling. In his 2006 memo, he said that he was unable to get adequate samples of the ever-moving plume. This Army report called, quote, Just the Facts, they based that report in part on your sampling, did they not? Yes, sir. But you don't agree with that conclusion? No, sir. Now, did the authors of that report talk to you as they wrote the report and put it out? No, sir. I never spoke to anybody that wrote the report. Curtis says in most cases, there isn't any excuse to still be burning trash. To those, and let me be honest and say, including myself, at least some of the time, who say, look, it's a war zone. Commanders are limited in what they can do. Their goal is to win the war. And what can we do with the trash? We did the best we could under the circumstances. Uh, what's your response to that kind of argument? Well, I don't know if it was the best that we could do. It may have been the decision that somebody made that we would do, but we have the capability. It's your contention, yes, we're there to win the war, but we could do that and take care by putting the incinerators on instead of using the burn pits for a long period of time. Absolutely.
there will be a time frame where you're going to have to operate in, uh, in, in conditions that, that aren't optimal. But at some point, uh, you know, six to eight years later, you cannot say, I just arrived here, so we cannot put funding in to protect the health and safety of our troops. We understand there's bullets, there's bombs, there's those type of issues that we cannot mitigate. But the hazards that we can mitigate, why, why aren't we doing that for our young men and women in uniform? Well, why aren't we? Uh, you will have to ask somebody else that question. <laughs> The company calling itself KBR, which stands for Kellogg, Brown & Root, cited ongoing litigation in declining our request for an interview. But they say they did not manage the burn pit at Balad, and where they do, they say they manage burn pits in accordance with guidelines approved by the Army. In a statement, the Pentagon told us there may be some acute symptoms from burn pits, such as coughing and reddened eyes, and that a few people may suffer longer-term health effects due to things like pre-existing conditions. President Obama recently told military reporters that he is aware of the issue and that, quote, nobody is served by denial or sweeping things under the rug, unquote. Now, when we return, jobs in Louisiana, fear in Alaska, the fallout from the big oil spill in the Gulf. Missed an edition of Dan Rather Reports or just want to see one again? We're now available on iTunes, so check us out. Welcome back. There was a time when Louisiana's oil and fishing industries lived side by side, uneasily sharing the same waters. That ended abruptly when oil began spewing into the Gulf. And as the crude laps up on shoreline after shoreline, the livelihoods of fishermen are suddenly going under. But they're only the first to go. The job losses are about to spread as fast as the slick. We've all heard that old expression about oil and water. Take a flight over the Gulf of Mexico now and you'll see evidence of it. By the barrel full. Mile after mile of crude swept along by the Gulf Stream. It's difficult to imagine all this is coming from one seven inch pipe. But nearly a mile below the surface, that's exactly what's happening. This is not an oil spill. It's an underwater gusher. Think about this, every day, 5,000 barrels of oil float to the surface. In gallons, that's more than 200,000 a day. And not all of what you see on the surface is oil. That sheen on the water is from a chemical dispersant used to break up the crude before it rises to the top. At the wellhead site, 50 miles offshore, rescue and recovery ships can be seen where the giant rig Deepwater Horizon once stood. But when you fly around for a while out here, what's striking is what you don't see. The fishing boats are gone. The waters from here in Louisiana all the way to Florida have been closed to commercial fishing, and it couldn't have come at a worse time. May is the beginning of shrimping season, or as Hosea Wilson calls it, bill paying season. It's a good season. It always was, you pay your bills, you know, you make your money, you, you make money, but you pay your bill, you catch up. But since the oil washed ashore, catching up is not going to happen. Hosea Wilson is a third generation boat captain, a marsh shrimper. His boat is docked right next to his grandfather's. He fishes the shallow waters off Plaquemine Parish, but these days all he can do is wait, along with thousands of other men and women who make their livelihood from the sea. Uh, back in 91, 92, I put that on my own. How come? I'm a commercial fisherman. I love it. I've been doing it all my life. I love it. I won't do nothing else. Commercial fishing in Louisiana is big business. The state is number one in the production of shrimp, oysters, blue crabs, and crawfish. It adds up 
to a $2.4 billion industry that supplies a third of all the domestic seafood for the lower 48 states. If I couldn't get a job for the boat, my way take it and put it in my backyard and make a swimming pool out. You could do all different kind of things with the boat, but if you can't go out there and work the seafood, it don't make no sense to have it. But there is a need for Wilson's boat and hundreds like it. In an irony as rich as the Cajun accent, the oil company responsible for the leak is now hiring fishermen in their boats to help with the cleanup. But first, BP wants the fishermen to take classes in hazardous material cleanup. Tommy Tyson thinks that's a real waste of time. He wants to get out on the water now. You got all kind of fishermen that some fish here, some fish there. Give them fishermen them booms, and they'll go close the areas off that needs to be. But no, we all stuck in here, and the guys that's down there is looking for people like us to go show them where to put the boom. That's the guys that need to be in the classes, and the guys that know where we're going, let us go do it. So many fishermen show up for the classes that many are turned away. The local police tell everyone outside to go home. Meanwhile, inside, the men and women who know these waters like the back of their hands wait for lessons on how to deploy the booms that can slow down the oil slick. Who's better in putting booms out than us? But we got to go through this. All kind of paperwork when we need to be out there working. Tommy Tyson and his boat will have to wait while the slick spreads. They don't stop it off. How much oil is going to come out of there? Fill the Gulf up? Yeah, today the wind's blowing it on top of us. Mississippi's going to get it tomorrow. Then Alabama's going to get it. Florida will get it. Mexico will get it. Texas will Because it can go around and around the Gulf Stream and just, it's not just us, it's the whole nation. If we can't get enough people together to stop this, it's not just Louisiana, it's going to be the whole Gulf Coast. Scenes like this will soon play out up and down the Gulf Coast. But the economic impact here, deep in Cajun country, has already gone beyond the fishermen. It's just like Katrina to me. I'm not, not really getting a lot of information from out there other than a lot of fishermen that are scared. Therese Crepel is the owner and chef of Lil G's restaurant in Belle Chase, Louisiana. A real Cajun dining experience, complete with gumbo, shrimp creole, and anything you want fried, including the pickles. Everybody you know is a fisherman. Everybody that walks in that door, they have generations of fishermen. It would be like a big factory shutting down in a little tiny city. It's the same exact effect. What do people do at that time other than leave? And no one wants to do that. The crisis did come right in her front door earlier in the day when an oyster man stopped by to make his last delivery. He comes in, he brings me six sacks of oysters, and he said, well, Mr. Therese, this is probably the last time I'm going to see you. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, he says, with, the, uh, with everything going on, I won't be fishing any oysters anytime soon. And with 95% of the restaurant's menu made up of local seafood, Coppell may soon be forced into a drastic change of cuisine. So we got in about another four days of oysters, and then at that point, we go to hamburgers and steaks. Ain't nothing like a fresh Louisiana shrimp. Nothing like it. I mean, if you ain't never had none, you, you get them. Because it might be extinct. <laughs> and what worries Hosea Wilson most is that after the well is capped, how long before the oil goes away? Or will it ever disappear? We're looking at a couple of years. Maybe no telling. Look at the exile valleys. They're still rubbing oil off the rocks. The Exxon Valdez spill happened more than 20 years ago, and there are still places where you can turn over the rocks and see the oil. That's oil. And this Gulf seabed is more vulnerable than the rocky Alaska coast. It's a rich, thick, muddy gumbo that acts like a sponge to everything, including oil. The grasses in the marshland where Wilson drops his nets are particularly vulnerable. You don't know how they're going to react to this oil. You know, it, 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 it could kill, it, it kill all the grasses, it kill everything. And once the damage is done, he feels the area's reputation for some of the best seafood in the world 
will be forever tarnished. That's just like anything, you know, when you get a bad vegetable from a, a certain company or a certain place, cover bad vegetable, you keep getting that bad vegetable, what you gonna do? You gonna go find somewhere else to go. And that's what's about to happen to us. We're about to be put out of business in Plaquemine in Paris. You know, this is where we was born and raised and this is where we worked at. And it's gonna, it's gonna hurt us bad, man. It's, it's gonna really, it's really gonna take a toll on us. Katrina took my daddy clean out of here, man. My daddy was a career shrimper, man. That's what all we did all our life, you know? And he had to move away, you know? He, and it just took him out of his game, you know? So I'm trying not to let this do the same thing to me. And the realities of Louisiana are the fears of native Alaskans where offshore drilling is about to begin. That story is next. Finally tonight, when the environmental disaster hit the Gulf of Mexico, a distant village on the cold, windswept coast of northern Alaska was paying particular attention. That's because oil drilling is likely coming to their shores soon. For years, the small native Alaskan population that lived there said, what if? What if a disaster happened? The energy companies assured them that today's technology meant they had no reason to worry. Drilling is popular throughout most of Alaska. It brings money and jobs. But many native Alaskans who live by the ocean and feed off its bounty do worry. Worry that their way of life, along with the pristine land and sea they call home, will never be the same. From where most of us live our daily lives, the northern slope of Alaska is literally at the end of the earth. Its ice flows, blowing snow, and frigid waters seem at first glance to be a forbidding and barren landscape. But this is the scene of a red-hot battle between two groups who see the same icy seas from very different vantage points. That's because this summer, for the first time ever, oil drilling is scheduled for the Arctic waters off this coast. On the one side are a hardy indigenous people who have called this place home for millennia and, backed by conservationists, want to keep it as untouched as possible. But big change may be coming. Petroleum companies estimate there's 12 billion barrels worth of oil below the ice and sea. They've argued for years that they can bring it to market safely and in 2008, under President George W. Bush, they were given the right to begin drilling. That was the story we went to report in early April this year when reporter cameraman Lucian Reed traveled to one of the northernmost villages in the United States. At the time, no one knew that perhaps the worst oil spill in history was only a few days away. The only way to get here is by air. This single airstrip is the sole physical link between the 800 or so residents of the town of Point Hope, Alaska, and the rest of the world. There's debate about it, but many historians believe that human beings first came from Asia to North America over the Bering Strait 25,000 years ago, and that this was one of the first places they settled. Not many people know this, but this place here has been known as the longest continuously inhabited region in North America. And a lot of people don't believe it, because it's hard to swallow. How can a brown, small person keep such a land that's so rich for so long? The natives here were so gritty and so strong to that protective of this, this region. Local resident of Point Hope, Robert Gallahorn, says his people have survived in this unforgiving climate for countless generations. 
and he told us there's a long history of outsiders coming to extract the resources here with little benefit to the locals. The local economy here is virtually non-existent. Residents eke out a life that is lived partly in modern-day America and partly in the echoes of their traditional past. They rely on a subsistence hunting for their survival. That means a strong attachment to the land, and even more profoundly, the open water. We use the ocean. The ocean provides for our people. And our customs and our culture is, revolves around the whale. It's our livelihood, our spirit. That's who we are. She's the ain't or isn't. May Hank is a mother, grandmother, and tribal leader who for years has been heading the fight to keep drilling out of the surrounding ocean. The ocean is our garden. If anything happens to it, you know, that's like 80% of our traditional food. There's beluga, caribou soup, and seal oil. Dana puts them in that small little bowl there for dipping the seal meat. I mean the caribou in. This long heritage of living from the ocean is what older generations worry will be lost if drilling comes to these shores. Point Hope sits on a little finger of land jutting out from Alaska's northwest coast, not all that far from Russia. To the north is the Chukchi Sea. In 2008, the Bush administration opened up the sea to oil and gas bidding, and the Shell Oil Company paid over $2 billion for the lease rights to several areas, drawing strong protest. In September 2009, more than 400 scientists from around the globe signed a letter to President Obama saying, the Arctic Ocean is one of the least understood regions on Earth, and that the decisions to grant oil leasing rights were made without sufficient scientific understanding of the consequences. Then, earlier this year, the Government Accountability Office criticized the federal government's environmental studies that allowed the lease sale to go forward. President Obama canceled future lease auctions in the Chukchi Sea and other parts of Alaska, but the administration allowed the sales already finalized to remain intact to the dismay of the people in Point Hope. When Obama got in, we had high hopes. But as it always turns out, the pressure of oil development is always an issue. Even after the recent oil spill in the Gulf, the Shell Oil Company is still planning to drill exploratory wells this summer in Alaska. But the people of Point Hope are not giving up. They've formed study groups, participated in pending lawsuits, and lobbied Washington. This meeting at City Hall is part of a native Alaskan organization trying to restrict oil exploration in the state. Once industry gets the foot in the door, that's how they operate. Their, their objective is just to continue to expand for profit. We're trying to protect what's left because the places that the industry are targeting right now are subsistence use lands and waters of our people. If there's one rallying cry in Point Hope, it's save the whales. But not as an environmental tagline. The whale hunt is a ritual ingrained in the native culture. Migrating whales pass closely by the shores, and a good year's hunt can help sustain the population through a winter. More than just a source of food, though, the animals carry a spiritual and cultural significance that affects every part of life. Celebrations that honor the hunt are held at two sites in the town, and whale bones mark the graves at the local cemetery, the large jaw bones for deceased whaling captains. Here's my first whale right there. That's Sally, Isaac, and Jonah. And this is my crew right there. 
When I first catch my whale, I was so happy that I couldn't believe it. I feel like a king. I feel like a king. Huh? Isaac Killebrook is a whaling captain who allowed us to accompany his crew at the start of the spring whaling season. Not much has changed over the years. Sealskin covered canoes are still used with harpoons thrown by hand. The weather has to be just right and the men patient as waits can be long for the whales to swim by in the right way. Robert Gallahorn was also on Isaac's crew. If you feel that animal respects you, you'll feel better about hunting it. You know, it's not like you gotta go out and, I gotta shoot that and I gotta shoot that and I gotta shoot that and I'll just take that and leave the rest. You, the animals know if you're that kind of a hunter. As indigenous peoples who have lived off whale meat for thousands of years, the native Alaskans here are allowed to eat and hunt a few of the animals, according to international treaty. While the men watch for whales, there is very little talking, just the sound of the wind and the water. When a whale is sighted, the men jump into the boat and paddle out with their harpoons. The boat gets close to the whale and the hunter strikes. If you look closely, you may see an orange buoy in the middle of your screen. It is attached to the harpoon, and when it starts to shake, that means the whale has been hit, but this one gets away. The hunters must be careful in how they hunt because not only are they limited in the number of whales they can land, they are limited in the number of whales they can even strike with a harpoon. And this day provides a lesson in the reason why. Even if a whale gets away, it may have been fatally struck. A few days after the hunt, a pilot saw a dead whale floating in the ocean not far away. Over the two weeks we were there, that was the only whale that was hit. Every other hunt came up empty. This hunting season will continue, but the men out here worry that exploratory drilling this summer will change the path of the whale migration away from their shores. If our animals start diverting their path or they don't want to come past Point Hope because of oil drilling, we'll be uh, just another people on the streets just looking for a handout because we can't hunt no more because the animals won't come to us. I have to have money. Yes, sir. I have a job. Yes, sir. I do need that. But that's all secondary compared to who I am. If I lose my identity as an Alaskan native, if I lose that, I am nothing. I am nobody. Economic opportunity is just one of their things they say they would provide for the communities. And in the past 30 years, what we've seen with economic opportunities is maybe three to five out of our community will be able to get jobs. For me to believe economic opportunities, no, I don't see it. We never see it. It's less than a week after the oil rig caught fire in the Gulf of Mexico and May Hank is packing for a trip to Washington, D.C. to join a delegation of native Alaskans. It's a critical time. Drilling in Alaska is set to begin in a couple of months. The Gulf of Mexico oil spill is on everyone's mind. Now, the native Alaskans believe, is their best opportunity to stop exploration. They've asked for, and been granted, a meeting with the White House. Wow. This side would be better to sit, see the water. There's a lot of people in other communities. A lot of them are too quiet because, you know, that's the way they were taught and raised, is to not get vocal and harsh. But, you know, you have to start doing it. Because if you don't, there's no way you'd be able to protect your lifestyle. We can still say as people, as Inupiaq, we, we oppose it. 
In Washington, the delegation is joined by representatives from the Alaska Wilderness League, an environmental nonprofit that is funding the trip. Peter Van Tyne is an environmental attorney working on their case. Anything he can do to help us stop the exploration in 2010 is what we're after. Our cameras were not allowed into their first meeting of the day at the Department of the Interior, but with the Gulf of Mexico crisis deepening, the delegation knows that offshore oil drilling has suddenly become issue number one in Washington. The Gulf of Mexico oil spill is a very significant event and uh, you know it really is going to take some time to deal with and they're appropriately focused on that. But we have a lot to learn from that oil spill before any similar activity should be allowed in the Arctic. And that's the message that these folks delivered to the Secretary's office today. Time will tell whether or not they're going to take those lessons and really see them for the Arctic. The group has an ally in its next meeting, Washington State Representative Jay Inslee. The science is totally unknown, and that's why I just do not think it makes sense to go into these very, very sensitive waters. Because an oil spill up here, we have no idea how to deal with it. Then, the biggest meeting of the day. The delegation finally makes its case directly to the White House, sitting down with administration representatives for environmental and Native American affairs. George Edwardson, president of the regional tribal government in northern Alaska, pled their case. And this is the migratory path of the bowhead whales mm -hmm. and 23 endangered species animals use this as a migratory path. We desperately need your help. And we need to put a stop to this. It's been a week since they started the spill. Mm -hmm. And just imagine that being under all our ocean ice. Right now, our ocean off the coastline mm -hmm. is all covered with ice. There's a whole blanket of it. Mm -hmm. There's no way they can clean mm -hmm. it under the ocean ice. And, you know, if that is taken away from us, you take away who we are. Mm -hmm. We may not always agree, but your voices will not be lost in this administration. They will always yes. be heard. Yes. Ever since I got to know Jody, yes, I more than agree with you on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Despite the assurances, the delegation has no way of knowing whether their message will help sway the administration to rethink leases in the Chukchi Sea. But the mood after the meetings was hopeful. Before the day's over, Obama will have heard what we have said. And that is the first time and the only time we've ever had this ability. I've been a president as a regional tribal government for finishing 18 years. And this year is the first time I can rightfully say, yes, I did reach the president. My perspective of the Western society is that they tend to destroy lands and oceans. Look at history with the Indians down south in the lower 48. You know, what did they ever gain from all of that? They never did. We are the last survivors. I say no in my traditional way. Can't, you can't touch it. That's our survival. Please, please let me hunt while I still can. At this point, it's impossible to know what the tragedy in the Gulf of Mexico will mean for the oil fields off the coast of Alaska. The energy industry continues to argue that drilling is safe, that the waters in the Arctic are much shallower than those in the Gulf, and that they are prepared for any accident. But the lawyer representing the native Alaskans said the oil spill is a game changer. We will continue to follow this story from Alaska to the Louisiana Gulf Coast in the weeks and months ahead. In the meantime, that's our report for tonight. From New York, 
For HDNet, Dan Rather reporting. Good night. If you would like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs, or if you would just like to send a question or comment, please email us at viewer at hd.net. You know, that's like 80% of our traditional food. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Report. Good evening from New York. Tonight, a mystery that doctors and scientists are just beginning to unravel. It began when servicemen and women returning from Iraq and Afghanistan began complaining of breathing problems, and it has grown into what may be the next Gulf War syndrome, the next 9-11 ground zero disease, maybe even the next Agent Orange. All of those maladies were initially dismissed as figments of the imagination. We now know they were all too real, each caused by exposure to environmental hazards. In this case, the military initially said that the suffering soldiers were only victims of coincidence. But that didn't satisfy a small group of doctors and soldiers. They're convinced it can all be traced to something in the air. They can be seen curling into the sky or hanging low to the ground over many U.S. military bases in Iraq and Afghanistan, billowing clouds of smoke emanating from mountains of burning trash. They're called burn pits, and at one point, there were estimated to be hundreds of them in both countries, some small, some enormous. Staggering amounts of waste are generated in military operations. Not only do commanders have to figure out how to fight, they have to figure out what to do with their garbage. For example, here in Baghdad, where thousands of soldiers live and work, hundreds of tons of trash are produced each day. That trash includes many thousands of things like plastic water bottles and foam trays, along with a lot of other stuff. For years, much of it ended up in burn pits. We tried to film the burn pits on a recent trip to Iraq, but the military wouldn't allow it. Many service members have snapped their own photos and videos that they shared with us. This video was given to us by a soldier on the condition that we conceal his identity because he fears losing his military benefits and his job. Iraq, June 12, 2006, and uh, a particularly bad burn day. By far, the largest burn pit was here at Balad Air Base. Balad is a transit zone for soldiers and materials entering the Iraq theater and its burn pit was the size of several football fields. This is a lovely burn pit. It burned plastic, metal, batteries, anything you can think of that gets discarded, they burn it and we breathe it. Was the burn pit the first thing you noticed? Yes, sir. And what did you say to yourself? Uh, I said, uh, I have a lot of work to do. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Darren Curtis was a bioenvironmental engineer with the United States Air Force. He was sent to Balad Air Base in 2006. His job was to protect the health of his fellow airmen. In this, his first television interview, he told us he was shocked by what he saw. What were they burning in the pits? Every piece of trash that was generated on Balad. Uh, rubber tires? Yes, sir. Plastic? Yes, sir. I've got a list here, styrofoam? Yes, sir. Paint? Yes, sir. Chemicals? Yes, sir. 
Well, what else were they burning that you'd be concerned about? Uh, electronics uh, uh, that may be, uh, have metals uh, tied to those and, and those sorts of things. Many of those are hazardous materials, right? Yes, sir. Does or does not the Army have regulations concerning the disposal of hazardous materials? Yes, sir, but there are certain regulations that are waived in a combat environment. War zones are tough places. Military regulations recognize that for commanders in battle, tonight, from U.S. bases in Iraq and Afghanistan, where there's smoke, there may be a major health crisis for American soldiers. We understand there's bullets, there's bombs, there's those type of issues that we cannot mitigate. But the hazards that we can mitigate, why aren't we doing that for our young men and women in uniform? Also, Louisiana's two main industries collide. What the oil spill means for fishing in the Gulf. Everybody you know is a fisherman. Everybody that walks in that door, generations of fishermen. It would be like a big factory shutting down in a little tiny city. It's the same exact effect. And oil and ice. A native people hope the environmental tragedy unfolding in the Gulf will mean oil rigs won't be coming to their shores. The ocean is our garden. It's our livelihood, our spirit. That's who we are. If anything happens to